Technology is a funny thing. It seemingly just comes out of nowhere. I mean, I remember thinking that my Motorola Razr was the hottest thing out there, and then all of a sudden, iPhones were everywhere. This happened with the internet, electric vehicles, and smartphones. For most of us, these technological transformations seemingly just pop out of nowhere. But in reality, there are decades of hard work that goes into making these moments a reality. I think something similar right now is happening in the world of fusion. For most of us, it might not seem like a lot's going on, but if you look behind the scenes, it's hard not to get really excited about what's coming around the corner. So today, I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about fusion. We'll start with where our energy system is today, how fusion works, and why fusion is just so exciting. Let's dive into it. To put it simply, fusion creates clean, safe, reliable energy. This is important because energy is our economy. If it's climate change, the military, technology, or healthcare, energy is the foundation of everything we do. Because energy drives so much of our day-to-day, -day, we use a lot of it. Let's start with how much energy we actually use. Since the Industrial Revolution in the 1900s, we've been building the energy infrastructure that powers our world today. In the next 25 years, we're going to need to double it. A big driver of this comes from a growing population. Billions of these people over the next decade will move out of poverty and into the middle class. On the technology front, the rise of AI and data centers is going to drive a massive need for clean, reliable power. We're also continuing to electrify and automate industry, which is going to continue to drive this hockey stick up and to the right. These ideas of population growth, poverty alleviation, and innovation are all amazing things. But this hockey stick trend up and to the right means that we're going to need to build a ton to get there. The question in front of us is, how are we gonna do it? What we need is energy that is clean, can operate 24 seven, 365, anywhere in the world. We have great solutions to get us there, but each has its drawback. Solar and wind, for example, are great, but they need the sun to shine or the wind to blow. These are great options, but their variability creates enormous challenges at global scale. Hydro and geothermal work great, but only in a few areas where the conditions are just right. Both of these are even more location specific than wind and solar. You either need rushing rivers or hot rocks under your feet for these two to work. Nuclear fission has been the workhorse of the energy industry for decades because it almost has everything we need. Unfortunately, risks due to meltdown and radioactive waste limit its wide-scale adoption. And of course, we have fossil fuels. Fossil fuels have gotten us to where we are today, but unfortunately they produce those pesky little emissions that we're trying so hard to avoid. Plus, there's only enough fuel on the planet for the next like 50 to 100 years anyway, so ultimately we need something else. We need something new, something that can operate all day, every day, be clean and totally and completely safe. This is fusion. Fusion is also not some distant dream of science fiction either. We know fusion works because it's quite literally the source of energy that powers our sun and stars. Creating fusion on Earth is often referred to as the holy grail of clean energy and rightfully so, it literally has it all. Is it safe? Yes, it's safe. It is physically impossible to have a meltdown event in a fusion machine. Plus, the only emissions are like helium and water anyways. Is it limitless? Well, more or less. We need two things for fusion to occur. We need the hydrogen, or H and H2O, and lithium, the same lithium you use in electric vehicles. We literally have a million years worth of hydrogen fuel in our oceans, and around 2,000 years worth of lithium. What about where and when you can use it? Fusion can operate all day, every day. Deployable where and when we need it, so no longer will we need sunny days, rushing rivers, or plentiful oil reserves under our feet to have access to our energy when we need it. I mean, this all sounds pretty amazing, right? What's the catch? Well, it turns out, bottling up the sun, not an easy thing to do. The value unlocked by fusion does not come for free. Fusing atoms is tricky business. Let's start with a little bit of the science. We create fusion by combining two hydrogen isotopes. Isotopes in this case just simply means two hydrogen atoms that have a different number of neutrons. When those two hydrogen atoms combine, they form a helium atom and one energetic neutron that gets shot out of that reaction with an enormous amount of energy. We capture that neutron in the form of heat, use it to boil water, create steam, spin a turbine, and create electricity for your home, just like any other power plant. 
Easy, right? We just push some atoms together and presto, clean energy for everybody. Unfortunately, not that easy. Fusing atoms together requires extreme temperatures, around 10 times hotter than the surface of the sun. How do we create machines that can fuse atoms under such extreme conditions? The good news is we have some options, but regardless of which path we choose, we know exactly what we need to do to get there. The analogy I like to use is popping popcorn. To make a nice bowl of delicious popcorn, you need to start with the right number of kernels. Too few kernels and, well, you're not gonna have enough popcorn to get through the first like five seconds of a movie and what's the point of a movie without popcorn? Same for fusion. We need enough atoms or kernels in the pot to make sure we have enough energy for fusion to create electricity. We call this density. With enough kernels in the pot, you need to have the right temperature. Too low and none of your kernels are gonna pop. This is again the same for fusion. Without enough heat, you're not gonna have enough energy to fuse the atoms together, and we'll be left with a giant bowl of nothing. Finally, once we have the right density of kernels in the pot and the right temperature, we need enough time to allow our popcorn to pop. Same for fusion. We need enough time to allow the fusion reactions to occur. This idea of density or the number of kernels in the pot, the temperature, the heat applied, and time are the exact same for if you're popping popcorn or fusing atoms. We've known for decades exactly what conditions we need to pop the popcorn when it comes to fusion. Or more specifically, what combination of density, temperature, and time we need for fusion to work. What we've been working on for so many years is finding the best way to get there. There are actually a few ways to create fusion. Each of them take their own approach to creating the density, temperature, and time needed for fusion to work. Nature actually figured this out first with, well, the sun. The sun uses its immense gravitational force to create the density, temperature, and time needed for fusion to work. Sadly, we can't create a sun on Earth, so we need to build tools that can do it for us. The most popular approach is magnetic confinement. These are machines that use super strong magnetic fields, quite literally like a force field in a sci-fi movie, to create the extreme conditions needed for fusion to occur. In our popcorn analogy, this is similar to a pot that holds the kernels and keeps everything together. On the other end of the spectrum, we have inertial confinement. This is where machines compress atoms at extremely high temperatures really quickly. You can kind of think of this kind of like an internal combustion engine where fusion fuel is sparked repeatedly over and over to create short, fast bursts of power in a cycle. In the middle of these two is a hybrid category called magneto-inertial confinement. As you might guess from the clever name here, these are machines that take elements of magnetic and inertial confinement to create something unique. Regardless, though, of which technology we choose, the goal for fusion is singular. It's create more energy out than we put in. In fusion, you can kind of think of generators like machines that amplify energy. If you put in one unit of electricity, you might get back 10 or even 100. What makes fusion so exciting is exactly this. It's a self-perpetuating energy machine. Now. There's been this long-standing joke that fusion is 30 years away and always will be. I want to put this one to bed today because it most definitely is not, and hopefully I can show you all a little bit of data here to prove it to you. Because science tells us exactly what combinations of density, temperature, and time we need for fusion to work, i.e. we know what conditions we need to pop the popcorn, we can track how close we are to achieving commercial fusion. Essentially, what we need to do is get up to the bright red contours in the top right here i.e. this is prime popcorn popping territory. Each fusion device built over the years can be tracked against this map so that we can see how close we are to achieving commercial fusion. Easy, right? Let's see what's going on. In the early 60s, we started to create our first fusion machines. As the time went on, we started to actually make pretty fast progress, moving up towards the top right, the prime popcorn popping region. In the early 2000s, that's when some of the first commercial fusion companies started to be built. And in 2022, we crossed that yellow line and expect our first commercially viable fusion machines to be operational by the mid 2030s. But look at this graph, there's a lot going on. Here's my translation. In the 1960s, we knew fusion could work, but we were nowhere close to making it happen. Since then, fusion progress has tracked to Moore's law, the growth rate that defined the explosion of the semiconductor industry. All of this work gave birth to the commercial fusion industry in the mid-2010s and to Ignition, finally, in 2022. 
We have yet to reach that prime popcorn popping region, but we sure are close. The first fusion machines are expected to come online in the mid-2030s. And I often get asked, why is now a good time to be investing in fusion? And I often like to point to this as a great data point. If someone were to have told you in the early 2000s that you should be investing your time and effort into fusion, they were lying to you. We were nowhere close. We are now. I think there might be this idea that fusion is some barren wasteland of progress with crumpled up scientific papers blown across the industry like tumbleweeds or something like that. This is just plain wrong. We are building and building fast. Commonwealth Fusion Systems is one of the leaders out there today. They're building a magnetic confinement machine called a tokamak, but in a much smaller, more compact form. This technology has only recently become available due to advances in high temperature superconducting materials needed to make their magnets. Zap is another super exciting fusion company out there. They are continuing to push the boundaries of what's possible and are creating fusion every day in their facility just outside Seattle. This fusion core behind me could fit in the back of your car. By making fusion modular, they can factory fabricate it and ship it to customers who can use it for industrial heat to melt steel or electricity to feed energy hungry data centers. Exapur is another promising fusion company out there who's leading the way in inertial confinement. They are building the world's most powerful laser and are directly working to commercialize the ignition moment that was achieved at the National Ignition Facility in 2022. But these are just three companies. There are founders and employees at over 70 companies around the world dedicating their lives' work to commercializing fusion because they too see that we're at an inflection point. This progress is what's getting us at Emerson and our investing peers really excited about fusion. For decades, fusion was the work of government contracts and R&D. No more. All the progress over the last six decades has shifted us into commercial gear, with investors funding over $7 billion of capital into fusion. In my world of venture capital, there are very few opportunities that fit the asymmetric upside potential that fusion offers. Yes, there are risks, but the prize on the other side is about as big as it gets. Now, I think it's worth double-clicking into what exactly this prize is. We talked about the probability that fusion can occur, but what about the potential of it? Why does fusion matter so much? Now, what gets me really excited about fusion is this tiny white dot. For 200,000 years, we used fire, or wood, as our primary energy source. During this time, society's advancements over those years was relatively capped because you can only produce so much energy out of a piece of wood. It wasn't until the harnessing of fossil fuels around the Industrial Revolution that a notable jump in our advancement occurred. By producing just three times the amount of energy for every pound of wood, fossil fuels provided us the energy density to launch our modern world. In the early days, this enabled factory lines, steam engines, and mass manufacturing of steel and iron. Today, all of our modern technology, from smartphones, cars, skyscrapers, even the internet, have been built on this foundation that fossil fuels provided and it's three times boost in energy performance. Now, what makes fusion so exciting is that it provides a 7 million times increase over fossil fuels. Just let that sink in for a minute. We built our modern world on a three times jump. Where is 7 million gonna take us? The opportunities that this opens up is enormous. Fusion's 7 million bump in performance enables a whole host of new industries. With that kind of energy, we can solve water scarcity, automate manufacturing, and build in ways that we've never dreamed of. Just imagine trying to guess the scale of technology today as the person who first discovered coal. We have about a 7 million times less likely chance of doing that. And because Fusion moves us from an energy-constrained world to an energy-abundant one, it also creates a social license to consume energy that we've never seen before. By cutting ties between economic growth and environmental harm, energy will no longer be the limiting factor that enables us to achieve the innovation and growth in our economy. And perhaps most importantly, fusion makes energy poverty a thing of the past. Every nation can now thrive with reliable, clean, abundant energy that will provide fuel for education, healthcare, and economic growth. This will empower billions and create a future where energy is a basic right and not just a privilege reserved for the few. There is a ton of global value that Fusion delivers, but what about emissions? I often hear, well, Fusion's gonna take so long and we need to solve climate change today, so why should we even bother? And I find this a interesting perspective. To reach net zero emissions by 2050, 
we have to have emissions fall off a freaking cliff. Let's be real, this is just not gonna happen. Even in an accelerated deployment scenario from the International Energy Agency, where we really kick things up a gear, we might be able to achieve a 68% emissions reductions by 2050. If we continue down the path we're on, under projected policies and technological progression, we will only see an 18% reduction in global emissions. We are nowhere close to solving global emissions, and Fusion is one of the few tools in our toolkit that can decarbonize giant chunks of global emissions, especially in the developing world in areas where renewables just aren't well suited. So, what do we need to make all of this happen? The biggest risk to Fusion is no longer science. It's not even technology. The biggest risk that we face is capital availability. Commercial Fusion is finally at a place where real progress can be made, but Fusion funding is peanuts. And I mean, it is literally peanuts. In 2023, U.S. peanut subsidies were larger than funding for U.S. fusion programs. This is also roughly half of what China is spending on commercializing fusion. If we lose the fusion race to China, we will have ceded solar, electric vehicles, and now fusion to one of our largest economic rivals, and China will dominate the energy transition and one of the largest market opportunities in a generation. We need roughly $4 billion over the next five years to stand up a commercial fusion industry in the US and stay ahead in this race. This is only roughly one fifth of NASA's annual budget and only about 1% of global annual venture capital. When you boil it down, the money that we need for fusion pales in comparison to the value that fusion can deliver. But above all else, what we need is you. The number of professionals working in fusion is growing every day from talent, investors, and policymakers. If you're interested in getting involved, reach out. Go visit some of these companies because they are quite literally building the future. So, if you can remember just three things from today, remember this. Energy demand is growing and we need every tool in our toolkit to meet that demand sustainably. Fusion is a lot closer than you think. Go check out the data and see how close we really are. Funding is the biggest risk Fusion faces. Commercialization is coming. It's up to us, though, how fast we want it to get there. Thank you.